failed. And we tried it again, and we failed again. Our plans did not succeed. But it was God's plan that brought us here to this place of receiving Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. It was his plan that attracted us because everything else had failed. It was his plan that brought us into a place of peace. And understanding that we could no longer do it on our own, it was his plan that has shown us that we no longer had to live in this world of, of, of sin, in this world of desperation, in this world of brokenness, that there was a different place where we could rest ourselves in Jesus. And we go, and we go into a church, and we find a place, a comfort place, where we can finally seek God and have a safe place to grow. And we feel safe all of a sudden. We feel like there's no judgment. There's no nothing. This is what the church should be about. No judgment. I'm not saying you're going to get away scot-free with everything because there's only one judge that's going to judge you. And that's God. And it's through his word that brings changes into our lives. I can preach to you and I can tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do, but that's not my job. My job is to preach to you the word of God so that the word of God can transform you and it can change you. Because I remember going to church and the pastor would look directly at me and he needed to stop drinking. The Bible says this, if not, you will go to hell. And that made me rebel even more. How many of you have been in that place? Oh, yeah, everyone, you don't have to raise up your hand, okay? But I think a lot of us have been in that place. Man, the pastor's preaching to me. Who talked to me about him? I know I talked to you and I talked to you and I talked to you. I'm going to talk to you at the church. And we become judgmental after each other. And we're like, man, we had nothing to do with it. All you did was ask me for a prayer. I'm not going to go and gossip about you. But the church should understand that it's the message and the scriptures and the, and the Holy Spirit that brings transformation into our lives. Going to verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Meaning, don't do nothing through conceit, meaning with arrogance or pride or an inflated ego. Because with that, you will not get anywhere. With that, you will begin to hurt people. You will begin to lose yourself in that area of life, and you'll begin to neglect God's people. And I'm not talking about Leadership, I'm talking about brothership and sistership. We begin to think that we're in, a, we're in a better place and we forget about those that are just struggling trying to get into the right place. We've all been there. We've all had our dirty laundry aired out. We're no better than the next person that comes in. But that person right there is in need of something, need of something that you have been able to grab for yourself. Because we get comfortable at times in the church. We forget how the other person that's coming in broken, how they feel. So we have to remember where we came from. But if we came from the hood, leave the hood on the outside. If we came from, from a different part of, of, of California, whatever the case may be, leave that on the outside because on the inside it's all about Jesus. We got to remember where we came from, where are where are our roots right now? Where do we place ourselves on? Where are we growing in right now? In Jesus, in the word. This is what stabilizes us. This is what brings life to us. This is what brings us and makes us who we are today. And because God makes us certain, uh, brings out a certain character in, in us, it's always important to stay in that character. Not go like this, church face on. <laughs> Church face off, work face on, right? Oh, getting ready to go to church. Let me take this one off. Where's that church one? Happy, spiritual, righteous. Pri oh, I can't. Prideful belongs over here. Hold on. Let me put this one on right here. I'm ready to go. We got to be real. We got to be real. If we can't be real, how can we be accepting what God has for us? We got to realize where we're at. We won't always be in a perfect place. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before the destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. But how do we realize when we're prideful? When we're not able to take in scripture and apply it to our lives. When we say that scripture doesn't apply to me. That scripture doesn't apply to me. But deep inside, you know that scripture is convicting you. 
Oh, that scripture doesn't apply to me. Oh, that, that message didn't speak to me. Huh? Huh? It's a common place where we find ourselves. And this is common for everybody, me, myself included. It's a common place that we can find ourselves if we are not careful or accountable to someone who won't be scared to tell us that we're in that place. This is where the accountability comes from. How do I know if I'm not going, if I'm going towards the wrong, di- if I'm going towards the wrong direction? Well, who are you accountable to? Are they going to tell you that you're going into the wrong direction? Or are they going to go ahead and say, no, you're doing good and allow you to go into that place of destruction? Because sooner or later, our hearts will become hardened. When someone tries to come in and, and say, you know what, brother, I love you. You know, something else is coming after that. But the Lord said, but the Bible says, but the scripture says, remember this, you told me to remind you, if you started heading this direction, you told me to remind you of the scripture, and you started ignoring it, that's when we know that we're in a dangerous place. James 4.10, which is a, it's another important part of the scripture, it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We got to remain humble. Humble, that humble, not gentle, but humble. That means allowing yourselves, allowing us ourselves to be able to receive no matter in what place we are in. That means if you are in a good place, you still will receive whatever is being spoken to you. You will still receive a, a direction like you may be going in the right direction, but if someone tells you, you know what, you could be doing something better, you're going to humble yourself and say, you know what, maybe I can be doing better. Maybe this direction is part of where I need to go. Maybe I need to pray on that and I need to start t- taking that in and listening to it. This is where we begin to go humble because sometimes we feel like we're going on the right direction and we're on fire for God. We don't want to be told, hey, you could do better than what you're doing now. We want to be told, oh, you're great and mighty servant of God. You are doing very well. You're on fire. Hallelujah. We want to hear that stuff because it puffs us up. But doesn't it feel good? When someone taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, you're doing great, you're doing strong, you're on fire, I see you doing great things for God. When we should be wanting to hear that from God? Having a confirmation from God? Esteem others and encourage in what they do, though. Because why? They are a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. We're all a work in progress until the day that we're gone. Or until the day we say, you know what, Lord, I've learned enough. Then you're just not completed. We are always going to be a work in progress. We will never know everything everything about the Bible. We'll never know everything about how Jesus works and why he allows crazy things to take place in our lives, why he allows us to be surrounded by even crazier people. We don't, we don't understand why Jesus leads us to certain places when it feels like we don't have nothing in common with them. Isn't that how it always begins? Because the enemy wants to try to come in and try to stop you from achieving anything more that God has called upon your life. So yes, of course, he will always make you feel awkward. He will always try to make you feel strange. He will always try to make you feel out of place. But if God has spoken to you something, then commit to it. Commitment is the hardest thing. Commitment is the hardest thing because we have a lot of marriage counselors that their marriage is all messed up, but they're trying to tell you how to live out your marriage. It sounds good, but does it actually work? It sounds good, but how's your marriage? Oh, not so well? Well, why am I going to take in that advice? Why am I going to apply that to my own marriage? Why am I going to apply that to my own life? You're trying to break me as you're broken. You want me to be broken along with you so we can hang out after work. That's what it is. Because sometimes people will try to bring you down. They don't want you to see you rising up in God. Sometimes people get envy, envious, 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 there you go, in church. Someone gets raised up. Well, I don't see how that brother or sister got raised up. They got problems. Yeah, but they're humbling themselves before it. They're submitting themselves unto God, and they're allowing God to change them through it. That's the difference. 
This is when we should say, you know what, man, that's awesome to see that brother. That's awesome to see that sister. Because they're actually having the courage to do God's will. I remember one time I was like, you know, I was, I was in that place years ago when I was young. And people were getting raised up as an usher and as a helper and this and that. Like, man, how come I can't do that? You know, what's wrong with me? I could do just as much as they can. But I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready to commit to it. I wasn't ready to what I would have to do with it. And heck, there's times where I wasn't even an usher at, a, at certain churches, and the pastor would have asked me to go up and pray for offering. I couldn't even do that, but I was all gun ho about being an usher. I didn't want to go up there and pray for offering. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know any scripture. I didn't know anything about, uh, about how to take up offering or, or open up in prayer. I didn't know anything about that, but I could do an usher. That's what I want. But what does God want? God may not want the same thing that you want in your life. So you may think you want to do something, but God's like, okay, I'll make you think you're heading that way. And then I'm going to put you in this position right here. He does it very, it's not even a word, sneakily. <laughs> he does that. He pulls the carpet, the house, foundation. He pulls everything that's underneath you that you feel safe in. And then once you get up and you're like, what happened? And you're, you don't even know what happened. And all of a sudden, God's just trying, starting to tug on your heart. I'm trying to get your attention here. I'm trying to pull you over here. I'm trying to show you something over here. What else do I have to remove from underneath you to lose your footing so that you could find your firm foundation in me? This is what he does in our lives. Anything that we feel secure in, he, that's going to be taken right underneath from you. He wants you to know that he is your firm foundation, that it's set by his word. His word is the one that's going to set you free, and it's going to help you to understand what your will is, and what, I mean, what your purpose is in his life. But we should be esteeming others and what they do. But we ourselves shouldn't be looking for it, but instead let God do it. Let God do it. Because in our hearts and our minds, there's plenty of things that we can do for God. But are we equipped and are we ready? Whatever it is that you're facing this past week or months, is it equipping you? Is it preparing you? Is God showing you something through this? Through everything that happens in our lives, God is trying to show something to us. God is trying to prove something to us. We have to allow God every single time that we're going through something to speak to us. You're not going through it just because you're going through it. it the, the biggest thing that I hear is that the devils take me through this, uh, take me through this trial because the devil don't like me, and so the devil's making me go through this trial. It is not the devil that is making you go through this trial. It is God allowing you to go through something in your life so that you can draw closer to him. See, things don't happen by mistake. Things happen for a reason, and we don't understand those reasons all the time. This is why we need to go to God and ask God, why is this thing taking place in my life? It's because that one thing that's taking place in your life is drawing you or supposed to draw you closer to God. But it depends on how we are seeking the change. How are we seeking the answers? Are we seeking it from Google? Google, I have problems in my, in my, in my work. What should I do? Hire a lawyer. <laughs> Call in sick. Take FMLA. It's not going to have the answer for you. But what does God say? I'm there with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If that's something that God has given you, that's something that he's going to keep for you unless he's going to move you somewhere better. That's the things that I have learned my whole life. My job has always been the source of security. I think maybe for every man, it's our source of security. It's our, it's, our, it's our livelihood, it's our, it's our check, it's our provision, it's, it's our security for our family, it's all that. But when the enemy comes in and starts messing with your job, we lose all focus sometimes. What do I do? What do I do? Man, I don't know what to do. Why? Because I'm even going through that right now. 
It's chaos. And again, my wife's like, you got to just trust in God. And you know what? You're right. What am I going to do anyway? I can't do nothing. I can't change nothing. But God is going to do whatever he wants to do. And I'm just fine with that. We have to get to a place of where we're fine with what God wants to do. No matter where it takes us, because it's only going to take us to, to something better, to something greater. And verse 4 says, let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In the world, we looked out for ourselves. We did everything we could to stay out of jail. We did everything that we could to stay out of trouble. But in God's kingdom, in God's kingdom, we need to look out for each other. We need to look out for each other. Matthew 16, verse 25. It says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And when you find it, you will realize that it's no longer about yourself. When you lose your life, you will realize that it's no longer about you. But the people around you that need it too. See, we received Jesus already. God has already taken us so far already. When we get to this point in our lives, we realize that it's no longer about us. That's about everybody else that's wandering off in different directions that are needing to come to church so that they can receive the same thing that we've received. But at the same time, we as Christians as, and as believers, we need to make sure that we're also getting what we need. We can't go out there with a, ca with a, with a cup half full and think that we have something for somebody else. Because the amount that you give is the amount that you received. So we can't go out there and save the world if we're not even trying to be saved in ourselves in church. I read a couple, a couple scriptures. I'm, I'm inspired. Well, what else are you going to give them? If they question you about your salvation, what are you going to tell them? If they question to you and ask you for proof, what proof are you going to give to them? And if you have nothing to say, I guarantee they'll be watching you. Watching you like a hawk. Well, I don't like being watched. Well, they're going to watch you. They want to see the substance of God working in your life. And I believe that that oldie song had something, something that we never knew about. I always feel like somebody's watching me. I need to find out if that guy was even saved. <laughs> Go to work whistling or singing that song. Verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He came just like us, just like you and I. He knew exactly what we needed, so he wanted to prove that if he can do it, that mankind can do it. He didn't have no special power. He didn't come down on a white horse, on a chariot with angels delivering him to the world. He came through birth. He wasn't born of royalty. See, Jesus put himself aside. He put himself aside for a reason, and he left his place in heaven to come down as of what? a servant for all. Jesus came to serve. Yeah, he, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the religious leaders, they all mocked him. They all tried to bring him down. Everything. Everybody except for his, the ones that were close to him, the disciples, and there's some believers that were out in the multitudes, but a majority of a lot of people try to bring Jesus down to stop him from progressing for the kingdom of, he of heaven. How many people are stopping you from progressing for the kingdom of heaven today? 
they don't realize the calling that you have upon your life. And so therefore, there's always a threat of them being left behind. Have you ever thought about that before? The threat of being left behind. If you're so close to people in a church, and all of a sudden they're trying to keep you the same, there's a threat that's going on. There's a change that's taking place. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be stuck in the same place, in the same spot. I see you exceeding, and I see you growing. I don't want you to go without me. So there's a tug of war. There's a pull, and there's a pull, and it's going back and forth, but there's going to be a breaking in there somewhere. People don't like to be left alone. Why? Because it's a lonely place. Nobody likes it. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This was his life. This is why he was born. He didn't expect anything in return. He didn't expect any recognition. He did everything that, that he did was out of love. What are we doing today with the love that God has given us? What kind of love are we showing towards people that, that, that we come into um, contact with on a daily basis? What kind of love are we showing towards them? And I'm not saying that you have to tell a stranger that you love them. Because that's just kind of, if someone told me that they love me and there's no background to that story, there's, there's going to be weird consequences there. <laughs> like, bro, don't, I, don't tell me you love me. I don't even know you. You're not a Christian. Why, <laughs> why are you telling me you love me then? You don't believe in Jesus. Okay, that's a problem. I'm not saying go and tell somebody you love them unless you know them. But be approachable. Be approachable. Let people, when they see you, see the light of God on you. Let them see the Spirit of God on you. Because in this world nowadays, we have to go to the grocery store, we have to go to the gas station with preparedness. <laughs> I'm prepared and I'm watching my back. Oh, I remember back in those days, I don't know how many of you are that old, but in these days, there used to be those infomercials on the TV Buy your glasses for $19.99 plus shipping and handling for $5. And I remember back in these days because I needed to watch my back. There's these, like, they were lokes, right? Those big old black sunglasses. And they had the mirrors on the side. Remember that? It was on the inside. So you could walk and you'd look this way and you could see people behind you. How many of you walked into something while trying to do that? I'm not going to say it was me, but yeah. Those are pretty cool. Because we always feel like somebody's watching us. So we're wearing those glasses. That they're like looks, and you're just looking like this. And you can sit behind you, and you're just like looking at your ears. And I mean, it's weird. You're all walking straight, and you're doing this at the same time. <laughs> like a robot, right? But those are pretty awesome. I don't know how many of you remember those. But sometimes we go out from church, and we go into our norm normal routine, and we feel like we have to watch out for ourselves. And you know what? Sometimes it comes down to that. Because we have to be aware of what's around us, but we have to understand who's within us. See, when we come into contact with people, we don't want them to see this. We want to see this. I mean, it, it, as hard as it is for me to admit, when I smile, that's when most of my wrinkles come out. Yeah. It, 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 I can't do no Botox. That's expensive. I'll probably come out with puffy, puffy, like, what is it? What you gonna call it? I look all deformed. People really think I'm mag dogging them. <laughs> but we have to learn to change who we are. How do we change who we are? Well, we gotta be willing to accept who God is in us. This is how we change. You're not gonna smile all the time, but the more that we try, the more that we get used to it, and the more it seems like we're not even trying at all. It's more normal. It's more, this is who I am. And I like it better than this. You know how they say, there's, there's that saying, you know, there's always someone bigger and better than you? Well, let's see if there's someone that could smile bigger and better than you. Yeah. You know, you go to, like, and there's someone that you walk into, like, <laughs> well, they got something going on. It was probably a Botox, too, that went wrong. <laughs> but give them something to ask you a question about. Because there's a lot of people that are hurting out there. 
There's people that have questions, and, and they, don't, they, they can't go up to somebody, hey, are you Christian? Hey, do you believe in Jesus? They, don't, they can't do that because there's, there's that thing that's going on in the world where everyone has their, their walls up. But there's a lot of hurt people out there that want to know about God. They want to know about Jesus. They want to know about asking them to their lives as personal Lord and Savior. But they haven't ran into somebody that's open, that seems like they're available for them to answer these questions. There's so many that are out there for the, that are looking for this. And while we do this, we should not be expecting anything in return. No type of recognition, no, no type of out of boy. God gives that. When we re- want to receive it from man, that's all you're going to get is a amen. Praise God. But when you get it from God, there's something that, that fills your spirit. And you feel like, man, you know what? I'm ready to go again. And nothing can stop that. Nothing can stop that. Even when you don't feel like it, it's the spirit that continues to move you. Verse 8 says, And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Humbling himself is a key, as we should try to always humble ourselves. But he was humbling himself to a point of death, crucifixion. That means in the time that Jesus was humbling himself, everything about him was being humbled. Jesus could have had a source of pride. He could have carried anxiety. He could have carried depression, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying to the Father, if this cup can pass for me, but if not, let your will be done. Don't you think that Jesus went through anxiety, depression, or some sort of of feeling during this time, knowing that death was right around the corner? And when he was praying so hard that he was even bleeding sweat, saying, Father, if this can pass for me, let it pass, but if not, then let it be your will. Imagine pleading for your life what you would experience, all the, all the, man, just everything in life just flashing before your eyes. This is exactly what Jesus was experiencing. And all of this, the king, God himself in the flesh, getting ready to be crucified, this was true humility. Because he could have called down legions of angels to save him. He, says, he could have said, you know what, this is too big for me. But it wasn't too big for him. He didn't preserve his right to be treated as a king, but according to how people seen him. When people treated him and neglected him and treated him harshly, he didn't say, I am the king, I am the son of, I am the son of the father, I am God in the flesh. He didn't use that title to gain respect. It was through his actions where he got the respect. And there's through his actions where he did not get the respect, but disrespect. See, people will respect you for who you stand in. And there will be people who don't respect you for who you stand in. But you ought to believe who is it that you stand in today. You have to believe in that. Don't be swayed by people and their choices and their words that will try to sway you away from fulfilling God's purpose in your life. you got to know who you serve. And when you speak it, speak it with your chest. Speak it with your chest. Don't talk like this. No, you're saved. You're born again. You're redeemed. You're a new creation. The people that come in out of your life, go and go into your life, those are the people that that God is bringing into your life for whatever things that you need. So if someone comes into your life and they're weird, that's probably what you need is a little bit of weirdness in your life. You have someone that comes in that's ghetto, well, that's probably not the right person. But there's all kinds of people that are out there that are specifically for you, that will help you get to that place. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There will be a time and a place just like when Jesus had risen to the heavens again and he sat down at the right hand of God in the same mindset and in, in the same heart and the same spirit, there will be a day that we'll get called back upon and that we'll enter into the gates of heaven and then we'll get into our own rightful place, which is in heaven. But until that day, we have to continue to choose to push through. And the years and the years are going by so quick that time is flying 
faster than what I have ever, ever imagined. I know when I was a kid, I couldn't wait for Christmas of next year. And it took forever. And I couldn't wait for Christmas of next year, and it'll take forever. Now that I'm growing up and I'm having to pay for all the toys and whatnot, man, Christmas is right around the corner. Can we take a time out, Christmas? Can we take a time out on the holidays and skip them at least one year? How many kids vote on that? Yeah. I don't like this guy. <laughs> Parents are like, yes. <laughs> Some people may not treat you the way you need to be treated. And some may not see the work of God in you. But just like Jesus kept pressing in towards the kingdom, it's the same thing that we ought to do to ourselves, following his exampleship. Verse 9, 311 in closing, it says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him, and given him the name of which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those of heaven and those of earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Imagine that day when Jesus comes back and the clouds are lit, and light, lightened up, are lit up and you see the glory of him just coming down. And all these years we've been pressing in and saying, Lord, no, we know Jesus is coming. He know, we know he's coming soon. And we're just telling everyone about the Lord. And that one day when we finally see everything coming up and we see the Lord coming down from the heavens, imagine that day happening and taking place. And imagine seeing everyone else looking up at the skies and saying, what is this that's going on? Is this the one that we heard of? Is this the one that they were talking about? Is this the one that you were talking about? And in that time of desperation, in that time of trying to understand what's going on, we're standing there and we're waiting to be called upon, to be taken into the heavens with Christ. Because it says in the Bible that one day he will come to receive his bride. You call me what you want, but I'm ready to be taken up as a bride. I'm ready to be called back, called to heaven. I have to ask God so many questions. I want to ask him so many questions. But at that time, would I really care? I'm in heaven. God, give me the wings. I'm going to fly. I want to see how it is to touch this guy. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. God is good. God is good. I want to, God, I want a lake where the fish bite my bait. I don't know if I have an appetite, but Lord, I want to catch fish. I don't mind, Lord, going to the lake and letting, letting my bait get all waterlogged and all that. I don't mind that. But when I get a boat on a lake of my own, I want to catch fish. The big fish that you can just sit there like 30 minutes just like this. Because I have infinite strength, right? I'm going to have infinite fun too. I don't know what God's going to have up there for us. I don't think I'm going to have any questions. I'm going to finally have that peace. I'm going to have, finally have all that joy. I'm going to have all these things that I have nothing to worry about any longer. I don't have to worry about keeping up with the house. I don't have to worry about anything longer are my kids safe because I pray that my kids go along with me. I don't have to worry about anything else except for just rejoicing in God's presence. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Father, we love you, Lord, and we appreciate everything that you have done for our lives, Lord. There is nothing, Lord, that we can speak of, and there's no word that can say that as as an expression, Lord, of the gratitude that we have towards you, my God. You have brought people into our lives, Lord, to help us.